This is Caught in the Act with Tim Clark. Welcome back. On October 21st, 1993, the Supreme Court of Queensland was asked to formally end the life of a woman, or at the very least, to confirm her death. Sharon Fulton had, by that time, been missing for seven years. She had last been seen at East Perth train station on the way to meet friends for lunch in March 1986. But she never arrived, and has never been seen again. In that court, on the other side of the country, Maxwell Robert Fulton, Sharon's husband, asked the judge for permission to swear to the death of his wife of 19 years. The judge noted that Mr Fulton had made extensive inquiries which had proved fruitless into Sharon's whereabouts and also stated her only asset was a life insurance policy worth $120,000. That policy was taken out one month before she disappeared. Mr Fulton was the beneficiary. The court on that day declined to formally end the life of Sharon Fulton and for decades since her children have longed for answers as to where she is and what happened to her. Now, 37 years on from that baffling disappearance, WA police say Sharon Fulton's life is definitely over and they now allege it was ended by her husband, Maxwell Robert Fulton. To talk me through one of Western Australia's most enduring and mystifying missing persons cases is the West's senior crime reporter, Phil Hickey. Thanks for joining us, mate. Clarky, how are you, mate? I'm really good. I'm really good. Now, shedding light on cold cases has become something of a specialty in your reporting in, in recent years. Why does and has returning to these historic cases become such a passion? Well, I think cold cases, I mean, there's just so many layers to cold cases. Um, You know, there's there's so much mystery. There's so much unknown, really, isn't there, in Mm. in all these cold cases. So, I mean, I think, you know, as we know recently, the police uh, announced $1 million rewards for about 64 cold cases. And I think Mm -hmm. if you were to look individually at, all of those 64 cases there would I mean there's there's just so many people and so many stories attached to each of those cases I mean there's so much unknown there's so many people that have been affected Mm. and I just think they're they're incredibly fascinating to go back and look into you know as a as a journalist as as a reporter I really enjoy going through you know old police documents and old court documents and going back and talking to people going back and tracking down detectives who may have worked on this case 20, 30 years ago, mm. going back and talking to families, trying trying to help those families get answers to as to uh, what happened to their loved one. I just think they're they're very, very important stories to tell. And I think we're we're very privileged in the media to be able to report on these cases. And um, for all those reasons, I find them quite fascinating yeah. and very and, important to report on. Yeah, and it's that last point, I think. There, obviously, there is a fascination and a prurience, I suppose, with old historic cases. But it's the it, journalists can rather, you know, not blowing, not bigging you up too much. <laughs> but there is a practical element. They can; Those stories can help, can't they? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I guess that, that really is the end goal, isn't it? Because, you know, we hear from the police all the time, someone out there knows someone out there has the answer and I guess one of the main reasons why we cover these stories and and report on these cases in the newspaper is to really I guess prick someone's conscience you know really try to get it out there keep it in the spotlight try and jog someone's memory to really encourage that one person or those two people in the community who might know what happened. Mm -hmm. And the case of Sharon Fulton, as I've just outlined, was one which you've reported now for several years. So Mm. give us the background to her life and and her disappearance. So just to kind of bring uh, your listeners up to speed, I mean, in a a nutshell, um, Sharon was a 39-year-old mother living here in Perth um, with four children. And uh, they, she was um, married here in Perth. with her husband and her four kids. They loved, lived in Duncraig. And in March of 1986, she vanished, went missing, 
was never seen again. Um, she married her husband in Queensland, relocated from Queensland to Western Australia in the early 80s due to her husband's work. He was, um, uh, Robert Fulton is his name. He now goes by another name, but we'll, uh, we'll get to that a bit later. Um, he was uh, in the RAAF and due to the nature of his work, he, um, they relocated here, settled in Duncraig. And yeah, as I said, in March of 1986, Sharon went missing. Ways and unhappy children, the routine stuff of police investigation. But over the past five months in Perth, five cases have captured the attention of major crime detectives. All were adult women with no reason to disappear. In March, 40-year-old Sharon Fulton of Duncraig disappeared after being dropped off at East Perth Station. Two months later, Cheryl Renwick... Three days later, Robert Fulton visited a police station in the northern suburbs of Perth and reported his wife missing. He told them that during a conversation with her the day before she vanished, she had mentioned she might need some time to herself. He explained that when he returned to their home on March 18, 1986, he had expected to find his wife there, but she wasn't there. He later added that he had last seen her at the East Perth train station where he had dropped her. She had been carrying an overnight bag. She was wearing a mauve and pink patterned dress. There were subsequent interviews with family and friends, a picture built up, and from a missing person, it was then handed over to homicide detectives, who, just three weeks later, wrapped up that investigation. The Crime Stoppers alert generated by that disappearance remains online to this day. It has been confirmed that Mrs Fulton did not attend the party as arranged and there has been no sightings of her since she left her home address in Duncraig. That post reads, The person or persons responsible for Mrs Fulton's disappearance have not yet been identified. And that is how it stayed for years. In 1991, the discovery of bones at a bush site near Carragullan raised hopes and fears that they may be the remains of Sharon Fulton. The painstaking search for clues that might identify the murder victim, how and when she was killed and who was responsible. Forensic pathologist Dr Karen Margolius and bone expert Dr Alana Buck spent most of today excavating the shallow gravesite discovered by chance by a calm worker yesterday. The examination of the skull at the mortuary gave police their first good lead. And from there I can tell you that we believe it to be a female uh, person uh, aged between 35 to 45 years of age, uh, believed to be Caucasian. A metal detector is being used to scour the gravesite for jewellery or other personal items. About 60 police and SES personnel searched a massive area around the grave while more investigators were poring over unsolved murder cases and missing persons files dating back decades. The age and genealogy of those remains did match Sharon Fulton, but eventually they were found not to be a match. They matched another missing person. And so the Fulton case remained shrouded in mystery and rumour, a rumour linking it with two of WA's most infamous killers. After an extensive search inside the house, the scientific branch began digging up the backyard this morning. Desperate for any sign of the three women still missing. The septic tanks were drained and the contents are still being analysed. But at this stage, nothing has been recovered. Yesterday afternoon, a stormwater drain not far from the house was also searched. A workman told police he'd found pieces of bone in the drain. Today, it was confirmed that the fragments were from a kangaroo. Phil, tell us about those whispers. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, a lot of people in Western Australia, they'd be um, very familiar, of course, with the horrendous crimes uh, committed in 1986, which was the same year that Sharon went missing. So in 1986, obviously, that was when the, um, the Bernies um, just committed those four horrible murders, uh, four young women mm. that they basically plucked off the streets and kidnapped and, um, and murdered. Um, thankfully, the police caught on to them, um, you know, what in, in mid-1986 before they could carry out any other... Um, of those sorts of crimes. So, look, I've, I've spoken to police officers um, over the years who 
are familiar with the Fulton case, they're familiar with the Bernie case, and they've been able to ascertain that the, the Bernies were not involved in, in Sharon's disappearance. Sharon didn't fit the demographic. The circumstances around her disappearance were were different as to, um, you know, compared to the, the, the four girls who were involved in, in the Bernie case. So um, I believe David Bernie, um, of course, he took his own life in prison many, many years ago. Um, he was actually interviewed by homicide detectives back in the day um, about Sharon's disappearance. And I think the police were, were pretty convinced very early on that David Burney and Catherine Burney had nothing to do with Sharon's disappearance. So, obviously, with that lead out of the picture, that left four children without their mother and without the answers they were desperate for. In 2006, WA's Cold Case Homicide Squad took carriage of the Fulton investigation. In 2007, a full review was ordered and carry out. And from that, dozens of new potential leads were suggested, including interviews with those four children, which had not happened until then. But unfortunately, police could not interview Sharon's mother, Betty, because she had died in 2005. From 2010 until 2017, roughly the same time between Sharon Fulton disappearing and her husband applying to a court to have her declared dead, cold case homicide detectives chased those leads. Prosecutors were eventually sent a file containing all that work. They sent it back and it was then sent to the state's coroner. And while all that work continued in the background, slowly, Mrs Fulton's children waited and wondered. Phil, in 2016, you spoke to Sharon's son Kyle for an interview, which pretty much laid bare the toll that his mother's disappearance had taken on him and the rest of his siblings. What was that like? Yeah, so back in 2016, I was a, uh, a young crime police reporter uh, at the Sunday Times when I, I remember I remember it quite clearly. I, I got a phone call from a, a police officer who said, would you, would you be keen to do a story on the Sharon Fulton case? And I, I must admit, I, uh, I wasn't very familiar with the case at the time. But uh, so I had to go away, do, do a little bit of research uh, into her case, and very quickly I found out, wow, this is this is definitely one of those cases that I'm going to need to you know look into and and um, report on a bit more. And yeah, I think the the day after I spoke to that police officer, um, I was put in touch with Kyle. So Kyle is one of Sharon's four children. And I, again, vividly remember very clearly the interview I had with Kyle over the phone. And I think we spoke for a good 45 minutes to an hour. And I, I could just hear the emotion in his voice, mm. um, just desperate for answers, desperate to know what happened to his mum mm. all those years ago. Mm. I mean, this, this was, you know, in 2016. So at, th at this stage, Sharon's been missing for 30 years. Mm. Kyle at this point is well into his 40s. I think he was 10 when his mum went missing. And it, you, you could just hear it in his voice how desperate and anxious he was for to, to get answers as to what happened to his mum. And, uh, you know, I'll just read you a couple of quotes here from, from that interview, if that's okay. Mm. Um, so this is back in 2016. Kyle said to me uh, in relation to his mum, Kyle said, she certainly sacrificed a lot. She had to look after four kids feed them and clothe them, made sure we went to school. We were never neglected. We got everything we needed. I can't really falter. She'd be the sort of mother that people should aspire to be. And I remember he, he kind of closed the interview by basically almost begging, almost pleading for someone to come forward with answers. So this is what he told me uh, back in 2016 as well. He said, I would almost beg for someone who does know what happened to her to give us children some closure so that we can give her a proper burial and know where, where to pay our respects. It's that void in our lives that we need to have filled. Mm. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's just heartbreaking. It really yeah. is. I mean, it's, um, as, as we've pointed out, that was in 2016 and Kyle then and his three siblings, they were desperate for answers back in 2016. And unfortunately in, here we are now in 2023. There are still a lot of unanswered questions in regards to this case. Mm. Where is Sharon? What happened to her? 
the police still don't know, her children still don't know. So it's it's still it's just a very very sad case. Mm. So finally, after thirty six years, a coroner agreed to hold an inquest into the death of Sharon Fulton in January this year. Another strand of hope at least, for Mrs Fulton's children to cling on to. Phil, around this time, you interviewed two more of Sharon's sons, Derek and Heath. Heath was just three when his mum went missing. What, what did he have to tell you? What was his, what was his insight into, into how this had affected all of them? Yeah, so Heath was um, is, is the youngest of the four children. So as you pointed out, he was, yeah, he was just a baby when, when Sharon went missing. So again, much like Kyle, very, um, very well-spoken, um, young man, you know, just desperate for answers, keen to know where his mum was and, and who was responsible for his mum going missing. And again, if it's okay, I'll just read you a couple of uh, of quotes of um, what Keith told me. He kind of talked about his very vague memories of, of, of his mum. You know, we have to remember that he was only three when his mum went missing, right? So, but he, he told me, my strongest memory would be of me in my cot looking up at my mother and I say the strongest because it isn't just a memory of looking up at her, it's more a feeling, a feeling of being safe. And he also said, it's difficult to think about missing something you never really had. I never understood what a natural mother and son relationship is supposed to be like. But like any child, all they want from their parents is just to be there for them, to show unconditional support in the good times and the bad. So again, very like Kyle, you know, Heath is very just you know yearning i mm-hmm. guess for not just knowing where his where his mum is and what happened to her but d- just just the tragedy that you know he never got to really experience that mother and son relationship because he was 3 mm-hmm. he was 3 years old when his mum vanished so he you know like all of his siblings um they they just weren't able to establish that that relationship with their mother because they were so young mm. and we hear of missing persons cases all the time, in, particularly in a media role, um, because mm. there is a media role to play in, in immediate missing persons cases. Have you seen them? Do you know anything? When Have you been in touch with them? But something of, of this long of a, of a span, um, you know, the, the news cycle is, is 24 hours now, as mm. we all know, and, and sometimes stories on a Monday can get forgotten on a Friday. Um, and so to revisit this after so many decades um, must have been very hard for them, but also be very challenging for, for the police officers. And in your dealings with them over the last few years, do you, do you find that cold case detectives are, are a special breed, a different breed? Uh, or Well, I think, I think they have to be because they're not out there on the streets at three in the morning chasing down bad guys or they're not they're not patrolling the streets of Perth or Northbridge um, in the early hours of the morning um, locking up um, drunks and so on mm. it is it is definitely a very different kind of policing and um, you know it's going through boxes it's going through witness statements you know I know you know I've spoken to some of these guys over the years and I know when they when they go through a case, when they start to review a case and reinvestigate it, they literally, they almost kind of lock themselves in a room with no windows and they they just go through boxes and boxes of old, like I said, witness statements, um, other, other pieces of information, clothing. Um, you know, they're working hand in glove with scientists at Pathwest looking for new... Um, possibly DNA hits on, on clothing that they may have unearthed in a, in a box somewhere. So it's it's a very, you know, these, these guys, guys and girls, um, um, detectives at Cold Case, they're, um, it's a very methodical, very slow um, process, I guess, um, compared to other types of policing, yeah. So it, it would, it would be very painstaking and, you know, they've got to be very methodical and, you know, some of these cases, you know, that they're working on are, you know, I mean, Sharon's case, it's, this is a 37-year-old cold case. Mm. I know some of the other cases that they're working on date back longer, you know, date back to the 50s and the 60s. So um, it is a very slow, painstaking, methodical um, method of policing. Mm. And in some cases, I would guess, 
modern day investigators going back and looking at investigation techniques from the 70s and 80s. I mean, that must be, well, how shall I put it, raise a few eyebrows from for the, to sort of the modern day detective to see how it was done back in the day. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, times have changed. <laughs> um, technology has changed, you know, I mean, back in the, you know, when Sharon went missing, I, I'm, I don't even think DNA was really a thing. You know, mm. it was still old school sort of fingerprints that police would rely on and, and things like that. Mm. So, I mean, obviously, as, as technology has, has evolved over the years, that opens up more opportunities for, for police to crack some of these cases, doesn't it? Yeah. So, as we've heard, it's obvious that Phil had, over the years of diligent and sensitive work, built up trust of the Fulton family. They'd spoken to him publicly about their mother for the first time in their lives. And in turn, that coverage sparked renewed interest in the case. In February this year, the family were called personally by WA's Director of Public Prosecutions, Rob Owen. In May this year, the case became one of several which were assigned a $1 million reward by the state government for information leading to a conviction. The Western Australian Police Force have always treated every case as equally important. Sadly, our reward system has not reflected that approach. It is a wrong that we are writing today. And then last week, Phil, looking across from my desk to yours, you looked um, puzzled and a little bit perturbed. Um, tell me why that was. Um, yeah, I was just basically trying to wrap my head around what was going on. So I think it was maybe on the Wednesday or the Thursday, we started to hear whispers, rumours um, that something was happening, that something in relation to Sharon's case was happening. Um, we didn't quite know what that was, but we knew something was going on. Um, and so, yeah, you know, as a, as a journalist, when you sort of get a tip about something, you sort of hit the phones, you're, you're reaching out to contacts to try and firm things up. So I think that was on the Wednesday or the Thursday. Unfortunately, we couldn't really get to the bottom of what was going on at that point. But then within, I think it was by Friday morning, wasn't it Friday last week, where the police put out a, a, a media statement to say that 37 years later, they have now charged uh, a man with Sharon's willful murder after all these years. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. What Phil did share, to share with me that night was a name. And he asked me to keep a little eye on the court lists over the next coming days to see if it popped up. Less than 12 hours later, Phil sent me an email with that name on a court list for a hearing that day next to a charge of murder. Good morning. There's been a major development in the decades-old mystery of Sharon Fulton's disappearance. The Duncraig mother of four vanished in 1986. For 37 years, her disappearance has baffled police. A 77-year-old man has now been arrested by cold case detectives. He's set to appear in Perth Magistrates Court, charged with willful murder. And after that revelation came, as Phil said, a statement, an official statement from the WA Police. At the time of her disappearance, Sharon was 39 years old and the mother to four children. The impact of her disappearance on those children has been horrific over the last 37 years. Her family and friends have been seeking answers and we're hoping today that they have some answers to her disappearance. What today shows is that WA Police is very, very committed to solving these offences. This offence is 37 years old and WA Police will never give up on any of these unsolved homicide cases. Nearly 40 years, Phil. Nearly 40 yeah, years. That's amazing. And WA Police now allege that Maxwell Robert Fulton, Sharon's husband, killed his wife in March 1986. And Phil, you were in court for his first appearance, but he didn't actually appear. No, it was a bit of a strange hearing. Um, so that was on the Friday. We should just point out before um, that gentleman that was speaking was um, Daryl Cox. Mm -hmm. He's one of the lead detectives um, at, at Special Crime mm -hmm. who investigates these cases. But yeah, so 
um, I think a short time before that press conference, um, Maxwell Robert Fulton, Sharon's husband, appeared in court. But again, as you said, he didn't actually appear. Um, so sometimes when people face court, they can face court via video link. Um, most of the time they appear in person. In this particular case, um, Mr. Fulton, he appeared um, via an, an audio link. So um, it was basically, I think the situation was he was in a wheelchair, um, still at the Perth Watch House, having been arrested the day before. So the, the court basically had to dial into the Watch House um, and there was, you know, there was a little bit of a brief exchange between the magistrate and and Mr. Fulton, but um, yeah, uh, and, and obviously as well the, the the point that you raise, yeah, no, he didn't appear under um, his original name, no. So mm. um, it's now transpired that um, he's changed his name to Raymond Reddington. Mm -hmm. So um, when that name change occurred, we're not too sure, but obviously he's. Um, so he, he'll, he'll now he's now appearing before the courts under the name Raymond Reddington. Um, so yeah, it was a bit of a bit of a strange appearance. Um, audio links don't occur that often, but um, w later on that Friday, the police released a video as well of his arrest, and we could see that he was in a wheelchair. Mm. You know, he's 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 a seventy seven year old frail elderly man now. So um, it's it's. One of the concerns, I guess, um, with with this case going forward is can can he make it to trial? I mean, yeah. he's he's a, a an elderly man now, yeah. so um, that's that's going to be something to um, sort of watch very closely now as we head towards a, a potential trial. Yeah, and were any of Sharon's um, children or family in court? No, they um, were not in court for yeah. the hearing. So I think they're still. I think they're still processing everything, really. Mm. I mean, they still don't know where their mum is, and now their father's been charged with her murder. I mean, it's must be a completely and totally overwhelming experience for them. They're, I mean, this all happened last week, and they're they're probably all still processing it. So, mm. no, they weren't in court. Uh, there were a couple of detectives from the cold case squad in court. Um, they didn't give too much away. I tried to chat them up a little bit and um, <laughs> tried to get a little bit more info out of them but uh, they were friendly enough but uh, they were the, they were just there to listen in and um, you know just observe the proceedings I guess mm. and that is part of the process obviously well, at this point we will point out that uh, Robert Fulton is innocent until proven guilty of yeah, any, of right. these, any of these charges. Um, we haven't heard any of the detailed allegations in uh, open court yet. Um, I'm sure that will be to come. Um, and so, 77-year-old Robert Fulton, who now calls himself Raymond Reddington, sits in Hakia Prison to await the justice system. He hasn't entered a plea. Um, he might not for some time. And so his children, the children of Sharon, will also have to wait a little bit longer to discover, finally, the truth about what happened to their mother. Phil, thanks so much for joining us to give us your insight and expertise into the, this long and winding investigation. Um, we will be sure to check in with you as the case proceeds. Sounds good. Thanks, Clarkie. And one very bizarre postscript to this case. After Mr. Reddington appeared in Perth Magistrates Court last week, it emerged that that name he had adopted since moving away from WA was not entirely unique. It is also the name of the lead character in the Hollywood TV series Blacklist. That show centres around Raymond Reddington's character, played by acclaimed actor James Spader, who was once one of the FBI's most wanted. But in the show, Reddington turns himself in in order to help the FBI hunt down other dangerous wanted criminals. And as part of that effort, at one point, the character is compelled to speak to a therapist who in the show is named Sharon Fulton. Thanks for joining us again on Court in the Act. If you've got any questions or queries or comments you want explored, then please email us at courtintheact at wanews.com.au. And please remember, if you want to know what's going on in court, 
don't get caught short get caught in the act instead see you next time